Welcome everybody. As you will see, you are all muted and you can't unmute yourself unless Audrey allows you to. So I'm Howard White, the CEO of the Campbell Collaboration, and we're very happy today to have Caroline Fines, who's Director of Giving Evidence, who has, um, you may have seen columns she writes in various places like um, Financial Times. Caroline, Giving Evidence is a, an effective altruism organisation that advises people on how to uh, best spend their money in an evidence-based way. She's been working with Porticus over the last well, year or more in the area of, of child protection and particularly on the evidence and gap map we're going to hear about today. And so Jane, Jane Leake is a portfolio manager for child protection at Porticus, previously working on Eastern and Southern Africa in Porticus. Uh, and they, they who commissioned the map via Caroline. So evidence and gap maps, as you'll hear from, from Caroline, are an evidence synthesis product to tell us where the evidence is. And Campbell's been producing a number of these over the last year and a half now. And the, the maps are really an intermediate product to identify the evidence and then help build an evidence-based decision-making product to determine, to help guide decision makers on how to use that evidence. And so the work that Caroline's done with Porticus is to produce a, not only the map, but a guidebook based on the map. And so it's very interesting for us, so at Campbell, to hear about how the map is being used and the work that Caroline did with Porticus to develop a guide, guidebook and from Jane to hear actually about evidence in use. So thank you both for taking time to speak to, speak to us today. Um, I'll turn it over to you in a minute. So you are all muted, all your participants. So if you do wish to ask a question, please type it into the chat box and we will take questions throughout the presentations. Every so often, Caroline or Jane will take a look at the chats and they might halt their presentation to answer a question that seems pertinent to answer that point. If, if not, then the questions will wait to the end of the presentation. So thank you everyone. And finally to mention, the Campbell webinar series is sponsored by the American Institute for Research, AER. So we're grateful to them for their support. Great, thank you, Howard. Um, Jane and I are really happy to be giving this presentation. Um, as Howard says, we have been working actually for two and a half years now on um, assembling and analyzing the evidence about institutional responses to child abuse, specifically the what works evidence. Um, and we're going to present to you today what we have been doing and also why and what we are going to do next. Um, I'm really aware that there are, well, we have quite a mixed crowd today. I think some of you know a lot about evidence and evidence synthesis and some know very little about that and some know a lot about child protection and others know very little about that. Some of you know a lot about both, some of you know a little about either and that's fine, that's totally fine um, and you know the aim is for you to come away knowing more than you did at the beginning <laughs> um, and so if there are things that you don't know please do ask. Um, we're also going to give ourselves permission because of that mix in the room to kind of start from the beginning a bit. So some of you who are very familiar with evidence will just have to be patient while we explain to your colleagues in the room who don't know so much, while we explain some of that from the beginning. Um, and similarly with um, uh, some of the topics on child protection. Um, so Jane, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Happy to, thanks everybody. Thanks Caroline, thanks Howard, uh, thanks Campbell. My name's Jane Leek. Um, I'm Portfolio Manager for Child Protection at Porticus. Caroline, shall I say a bit about Porticus at yeah, this point? Please. Okay. So Porticus is a family foundation. It's the family foundation of the Brennickmeyer family. We are based in, well, we have five regions. We've got offices in Nairobi, in Sao Paulo, in New York, in London. I'd say it's a medium-sized family foundation that is interested in early child development, education, human trafficking, church and faith. In fact, particularly the sort of um, faith and the civic square, if you like. And it's interested in child protection. As a foundation, we've gone from being very regionally and geographically focused to being 
topic focused, such as early child development, such as child protection. So we make about a thousand donations a year in about 90 countries. And it started with an aspect of due diligence. Um, so we asked our grant holders um, for their safeguarding policies. Um, and we realized we had to do an awful lot in the sort of countries that we're working in, Albania, um, Zimbabwe, um, all over the place. Um, Ukraine, a lot of people didn't really have a good idea of what a safeguarding policy consisted of. So we were, we were conscious that there was a real gap. And we were conscious that there were different standards of safeguarding policies. There are HQI standards for the development agencies. There's keeping children safe standards. There's ECPAT standards. There's Presidium standards. So we were taking this incredibly seriously. And at the same time, we were moving into a portfolio way of working. And they asked Caroline the sort of weird question, has it ever been proven that having a safeguarding policy has kept anyone safe? And we thought, seeing as we were starting off a child protection portfolio more or less from scratch, where do we start? So we thought the best place to start would be an evidence and gap map because we couldn't find any studies that a bunch of, of non-specialist grant makers who want to be driven by the evidence where where do we go there, there just wasn't a product and the reason i put this map behind me it's a sort of old-fashioned 1970s gazetteer so imagine it's blank or half of it's blank um, so we set out on this journey as a foundation and my team's based all around the world in lots of different locations. Um, and they, were, they really participated in, in the project that you will see Caroline unfolding to you. So is that a sort of a introduction great. of myself and Porticus <laughs> and the project? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about is, um, there's four sections. We're going to talk about the context, where we were, what we wanted to get to, and why we took this route, and what other ways we were trying to learn. What we did, and then what we found, and then what we're doing next. Um, so, um, so as Jane um, has, has mentioned, I don't know if you want to say anything about, uh, more about this, Jane, that, that Porticus was really keen for its work in child protection. It's a funder. Um, to be as effective as possible. And that means basing it on good evidence about effectiveness. So this whole story is about what works. And so there were basically two, and that, that sentence at the top of that slide might seem to you, especially if you're an evidence, evidence Easter, might seem to you like the most natural thing in the world, but it is not that natural or even that common for foundations to really work that hard in my experience at finding evidence in order to inform their, um, their funding and their work. Um, so that was great. <laughs> so we had two questions then, you know, where is there good evidence? Well, what is their evidence about? You know, where is there kind of solid ground that we can stand on? And secondly, what does it say? So we did basically two projects which look at, e at each of those. The first is addressed by the evidence um, and gap map, which is, um, so we searched for the relevant evidence and then we categorized it and we mapped it and that's what forms an evidence and gap map and then um, inspired by a gazetteer of the type by <laughs> Jane um, we created a guidebook and that basically summarizes what the evidence says and the aim of the game in all of this was to inform Porticus in its own funding and also to provide resource to inform the wider sector so other funders and Porticus's grantees and other practitioners who are not Porticus's grantees and policy makers and so on to to bring together everything that is useful and relevant in this um, terrain. Jane do you want to say anything else about about that where it, where this started? I don't think so we we were grant making at the same time as the map was being researched the only other thing to say is that we've We've taken an institutional 
lens. So we're not talking about child protection in, in the home. We're not talking about familial child abuse. We're talking about extra familiar child, child abuse and the, the, both the preventative nature of institutions and organizations, but also where organizations can get it wrong. Organizations responsibility for the safeguarding of the children within them. So it's a bit, there are other maps that exist about child violence. So ours is a bit of a particular map. That's the only additional okay. thing I'd say. Great, so I would just, as we go through, just bear in mind these two questions up here, A and B, where, where is there good evidence and what is there evidence about and what does it say? That's what we were trying to understand in order to inform practice. Um, and so now we're gonna look at what we did and what we found and actually I'm gonna split this um, into looking at the first question, A, what evidence is there? And I'll show you the evidence of gap map. And then what does it say? B, which is the guidebook. Um, and this, this can get quite technical. And so if you don't understand, then please write a question in the chat and we will answer it. Um, that, you know, it's one of those things that if you're really familiar with something, it can become kind of difficult to remember. <laughs> Not everybody is. So, so just if you want to know more, I'm happy to explain more or again or more slowly. So you may remember in school doing a study where you have to estimate the number of leaves or whatever in a field and you go to the field and you put a square on the field and that is your sample and maybe your square is one meter square or something and you study everything all and only the things that fall into your square so you define your terrain of interest and you study all and everything and only things that are in that square and the way that one goes about creating an evidence and gap map really reminds me of that process. So we used what's called a systematic review method. So we, we are systematically searching for and reviewing the evidence, the, the rigorous published evidence in the whole in the world. And we set out the domain in which we are interested um, and then we search through academic databases and um, sources of non-academic studies in order to find everything or as best we can everything that falls within our square of interest okay and i'm going to describe in a second what our square of interest um, is um, and um, we did this work with the center for evidence and implementation and monash university both in australia um, and the reason that we take this method, and it's a very well um, established method of doing a, a study of studies, is this great quote I love at the bottom from Ben about that it's a, we take a scientific systematic approach to the very per process of looking for scientific evidence. And the reason that we do this is to ensure that our evidence is as complete and as representative as possible and that we don't have little biases creeping in. So we don't have in a standard literature review that's not scientific and not systematic. You know, you might decide that you like this paper or you don't like that paper. And so you have some um, authority as the researcher to decide what goes in and what goes out, basically whether you like it or not, maybe it's because it, you agree with it or not. Um, and so you can end up with a skew in the set of studies that you um, incorporate and that you include. So we take a scientific approach to, um, to this, to deciding what studies get included. Um, as I mentioned, so we were here in this particular study, in this our square on the field, we were only interested in impact evaluations, that is to say what works studies. So we are looking at um, studies which look at the effect of some intervention on some outcome. So for instance, there's a study that I'll talk about probably the Good Schools Toolkit, which is an intervention, it's a, a program that's delivered in schools um, in, it's been used in Uganda and the question, somebody might do a study where they um, study what effect does that have on reducing violence by staff in schools and on children's mental health and on children's perception of safety and so on. 
So, um, we are, so we are only interested in what works studies. So we are not interested in, for the purpose of this study, of um, studies on, let's say, the, the scale and nature and location of the problem. And that's not because we don't think they're important. It's just because, you know, with any study, you can't study the whole world. We have to study something kind of bounded. And so we were only interested in what work studies. We're also not interested here um, for this study in understanding um, survivors' perceptions of what happened to them. I mean, you know, as human beings, we are very interested in that. And I know that Jane and the team are very interested in that and have other strands on that. But for this study, uh, we didn't look at the nature of the problem or the location. We didn't look at survivor experiences or stories. And we didn't look at um, what organizations are doing. So that's what, I mean, medics would call those prevalence studies, the prevalence of activities. So we wouldn't look at, you know, how, what proportion of schools have um, safeguarding policies, for example, or, you know, what our church is doing. Um, so we were just looking at um, what works studies. And we were only, within those, we were only interested in fair tests. So, you know, we're trying to do science here. So we're trying to understand the effect of this intervention on this outcome. And as you know, in the world, there's loads of things going on at any one time. And if you have to be pretty careful to ensure that a primary study that's looking at um, the effect of an intervention really isolates the effect of that intervention. So you don't want to be looking at just what happened before the intervention versus what happened after it, because maybe a bunch of other stuff changed in the world, as well as your program being delivered. So you haven't there isolated the effect of your program. It's not a fair test. Um, and so this diagram kind of explains we will, in a way how we think about a fair test. In an ideal test, fair test, you have two groups. One gets the intervention and one doesn't. So maybe they get nothing or maybe they get a different intervention. But ideally, the only thing that differs between those two groups is the intervention that they got. Um, and then, therefore, if, if they are the same in all other respects, if you measure the difference in an outcome, like the amount of violence that those two groups of children um, experience at school, let's say, um, then you can be pretty certain that the difference that you observe arises because of your intervention, i.e. it is due to your intervention. So that tells you the impact or the effectiveness of your program. Um, and really the ideal way to do that is you start with one group of people or one group of schools or one group of institutions and one group of things and you divide it up randomly um, and into those who get the intervention and those who don't, or those that get intervention A and those that get intervention B. And then you measure the outcomes before the intervention and the outcomes afterwards and that will give you a fair test and that is a randomized control trial such as are used in medicine and you are very happy that the um, vaccine the covid vaccine that you have got or hopefully will get soon has been through randomized trials <laughs> like this because they are a good fair test um, and so for our um, square on the field, our study, we were only interested in fair tests, which meant that for primary studies, we only looked at randomized control trials and studies that are called quasi-experimental designs, which are pretty similar to RCTs like this, um, and you do them if for whatever reason it's not possible to randomize. Um, and um, so those are the types of primary studies, so studies of people that we included. We also included systematic reviews, and those are reviews of, they, they are themselves where somebody has put a square on, a, on the field and looked at primary studies within them. Um, so we only had three types of study, randomized trial, uh, quasi-experimental design, and systematic reviews within our map. Um, Jane um, alluded a bit to and we talked about how we were only interested in, in, in child abuse within institutions and institutional responses to it. Um, and so, that is, th so this slide gives you the parameters that define our square on the field, okay? So with children up to 17 years, geography could have been anywhere. We looked included in, at studies published in a bunch of languages, um, uh, a bunch of European languages. Um, we included um, studies that were finished and that were ongoing. And, th and the most important thing is that it was in institutional settings. So we looked at 
interventions that are run in schools, sports clubs, churches, residential camps, and all of that kind of thing, daycare, we did not include in family care. Um, and we had a bunch of types of intervention and a bunch of types of outcome um, and a bunch of types of studies. And I should say that this evidence and gap map is being published with um, Campbell through their peer review process. And so there, we've published already a long report that details all of this and there's coming a more academic -y version of it. Um, in an evidence and gap map, it's basically a population density map. So we're trying to find all of the evidence that exists, everything within our square, and then to codify it and to display it graphically. And the way that we display it graphically is that we have a grid and the grid, the rows are, this is a kind of a schema of one, the rows are interventions and the columns are outcomes. And if we find a study which looks at the effect of intervention number one on outcome number one, then we put the study in that box. So in my example, the Good Schools Toolkit that I mentioned in Uganda is an intervention. And it looks at uh, violence as perpetrated by staff in schools. And I don't just mean normal capital, normal um, corporal punishment, but violence. Um, and so then we would put that study in the relevant cell on this map. Often we come across a, a study which looks at the effect of one intervention on multiple outcomes. So the Good Schools Toolkit was measured for its effect on uh, physical violence by staff and on children's well-being and some other things. And in that case, we put the study in every cell to which the study pertains. Okay, so a study can appear multiple times on the evidence and gap map. Some studies look at multiple interventions or maybe there'd be an intervention that has multiple bits. So you might have a program that runs in schools, for example, which is partly about teaching children how to, um, how to avoid abuse happening to them, but it also teaches them about how to disclose if they think they have been abused. So that would appear as two types of intervention, okay? So it can appear in multiple times. And the purpose of this is that if you are a funder or a practitioner or a policymaker, and you are interested in some intervention or some outcome, the map will help you to find basically all the studies, the rigorous what work studies that have been done into that question. Okay, that's kind of the aim of the game. There were six kind of scenarios that we expected to find within the evidence and gap map. Well, there's basically three. So one is what we call yes land. So yes, there is some evidence <laughs> here. Yeah, you're interested in the effect of this intervention on that outcome. Yes, the research says something about that. Then there is no land, like bad luck, there's nothing there. You're on your own, we don't know. And then there's a kind of squidgy area between yes land and no land, which we call a sand bank, which is where the evidence might be rubbish or it might be very mixed or it might come from a, a place or a time that's very different from you. Um, so there, you know, it's not, you're not quite in no land because you're not completely on your own, um, but you're not, there is, the ground isn't terribly solid for you to stand on. And then within yes land, clearly there are various things that the evidence could say. It might show this intervention has a positive effect on that outcome. It might show no effect. It might show a negative effect that the intervention is harmful, or it might be kind of mixed, or it might be inconclusive. So these were the kind of scenarios that we had um, in mind. So now I'm gonna show you this busy slide shows you the graphical representation. This is our map, basically, uh, a flat version of it. I'm going to show you a groovy interactive version uh, later, which is the version that I expect you, you that you, I expect um, will be more useful to you. But just so you can see it all in one go. So we divide, so I'm just going to talk you through the frame first, and then I'm going to talk you through the colors, and then I'm going to talk you through the comments on it. So the frame, the, like I mentioned, in an evidence and gap map, the, um, and I should say that evidence and gap maps have been done in, in quite a few sectors now, and Campbell is really leading the charge on that. So if you are 
in any area of social policy, it's worth looking to see if there is one, because they can save you a ton of work. Um, so in evidence and gap maps, normally the interventions are rows, and we divided the child protection kind of world into four buckets of intervention. There's work around prevention of abuse, there's work encouraging disclosure, there's work around response, so you know, what you do when somebody has uh, responded, so that might be involving um, social services, for example. And then there is treatment, so therapeutic type treatment. So those are the four rows that we had. And then we divided uh, up, we identified loads of outcomes, I think there's 13 here or something, um, outcomes, and you can't really read it on here, but there are some that are about institutional safeguarding practice. There's a bunch that are, there's some about child safety. There's a bunch that are around child well-being, so um, physical health, mental health, social and emotional functioning, and cognitive functioning, for example. There's some outcomes that are around adult perpetrators, so desistance and recidivism. And there's some about child perpetrator, and there's some about parent um, or caregiver behavior. Coming up with this frame was actually quite difficult because uh, if you consider an organization having a safeguarding policy, that is at some level an intervention, you know, it's designed to produce some outcomes, but it can also be an outcome of itself because you may have to do work with an organization to get it to have a safeguarding policy. So it can feel like a kind of an interim outcome. Um, but obviously we just felt that if we had, you know, interventions that were also, you know, you can't really have a map, that, a grid that has some of the rows also being columns or it would just become a complete model. <laughs> so this is the grid um, that we used, okay. Um, within each, so each cell, I think I explained earlier what cells are. Um, so they show the effect of an intervention on that particular outcome. Um, and I mean, the first thing to say is there's not many studies on here. There's only eight, 72 studies that, um, and of those, uh, only 58 are completed primary studies, so studies actually on people that are finished. There are some uh, 11 systematic reviews. And there are some instances where somebody has done a study, and this is absolutely fine and great, where someone's done a study and then multiple academic papers have been written based on that one study. Um, and so we actually have 82 papers here. So for example, you may remember the, um, those awful, awful orphanages in um, Romania, for example, after the Ceausescu regime fell. And there was in uh, 2000, a program set up, actually set up by some American academics to um, take some of those children into foster care. It's called the Bucharest Early Intervention Project. Um, and it was set up in 2000 and it started in 2001 and it was working with children, most of whom at the time were under three years old. Um, and because there were far, far more children than they could possibly put into um, foster care available, they had to choose somehow, so they randomized it. So they've ended up with a randomized trial. And, and those children and some of the children who didn't get put into foster care because there wasn't space, um, are measured at various points through their lives. And the most recent one was not very long ago, because so kids are now, you know, in their, like getting on for 20. Um, and so there's multiple papers that have written about them, but they're the same set of children. Um, and so that counts as one study, but multiple papers. And there's a few examples of that. So anyway, so within each, so the first thing to say, there's not much on here. Um, and as you can see, the material that's here is massively concentrated in that top row, which is about prevention. Within each cell, there are three blocks. So in, if you look at the cell here with this big concentration, you can see there's a bunch of studies that are shown in gray. Then there's a bunch, there's a great big tall column in the middle and the one, and then the column on the um, right. So the column on the left is the quasi-experimental design, that is the primary study. The column in the middle are the randomized control trials and the column on the 
right is the system asset reviews that's shown at the bottom here and the reason i'm telling you all of this is because quite often you find cells like the ones in the encouraging disclosure row these cells have studies but they only have systematic reviews and we did unzip what i call unzipping the systematic reviews that were included to see if there were any includable any relevant primary studies inside of them and there were not so what so if you see a cell which only has a systematic review in it that basically means that you that it's empty that we didn't find any of the type of fair tests that we wanted to include um, these um, the, the coloring here is that we looked at the risk of bias in the in each of these types of studies um, so if they are red there's a high chance of risk of bias yellow is some and green is low um, and again um, so if something has a high risk of bias it's pretty it's quite likely that the um, uh, the results that it thinks it found and that it's reporting are not correct because they'll be skewed one way or another. Um, so there's not much going on here that's green. There's not much going on here that's low risk of bias. That is that we can really rely on. So I guess the kind of first thing is that there's not much evidence and what there is, is mainly about prevention. So in encouraging disclosure, response and treatment, it's really empty. Um, and even what there is in general is not reported very well so quite high it's not very high uh, reliability we can't have much confidence in what it says so that's <laughs> not a therapy it's not a very encouraging picture but you know we are where we are and it's better to know where we are than to not know where we are um, so uh, there's this one to, to talk about the comments here there's this one cell in the kind of middle top um, which is the, clearly the most populous cell. There are for, fully 42 um, primary studies here, and we only have 58 completed primary studies in the whole map. So, you know, massively overwhelming. Most of them are in this one cell, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but those are programs to, they're in educational settings, and they are to prevent abuse, specifically sexual abuse, most of them. And they are to teach children about good touches versus bad touches. So, so how, to, how to know what's going on um, and to recognize it. Um, and uh, slightly amazingly, in my view, almost all those studies have been conducted in high income countries. I think any have been conducted in low income settings. Um, and most of those um, um, programs seem to work. Uh, so that is pretty um, encouraging. But so there's big concentration there. We found zero studies about how to encourage disclosure. And that seems kind of amazing, given that it's such a big issue. I mean, disclosure is a really hard thing to measure. Jane and I were talking about this earlier, because do you want the rate of disclosure to go up or down? You know, it might go up if there's more abuse. But it might just be you're not affecting abuse, but you are affecting people coming forward to try to get help. Or maybe you know you're reducing abuse, but having um, the rate of disclosure go up at the same time. So <laughs> it's really a it's really unattractive thing basically to measure. Um, in terms of response, this third row again, very little on that. And on treatment, no, um, that actually there's only two separate studies there. There's the um, Bucharest program that I mentioned, which has um, produced multiple papers, and then there's one other, but none of them, no primary study on treatment has started in the last 20 years. And that also seems kind of amazing, given the amount of disclosing and press activity that there's been around institutional child abuse within um, sports and schools and churches and so on. So that is kind of the one shot picture of what the evidence of that map um, looks like. Just to talk about the headline findings of it, um, as I mentioned, we had 82 studies, uh, which turns out to be 71 once we've removed, duplicates is a harsh word, but um, instances that I talked about where there were multiple studies written or where there was a syst one systematic review that had been updated sometime later. So we had um, 58 completed primary studies, uh, which is really, you know very little given that we looked over essentially the whole of time and all geography 
There's a terrible match between where these studies have been conducted and where the world's people are. So there is zero studies of this from India. That's a billion people. There's only two from China, that's another billion people. Um, there's three from Africa and I think two from Latin America. Um, so this is not unusual um, in social science research, but obviously it is pretty striking finding. And for a funder like Jane, who has a portfolio in many countries, that is a, a problem. So most studies are from the um, Canada, the US, and Western Europe, and then this load in Romania. And obviously, you know, some of Jane's team are working on reducing abuse within the church in Zimbabwe, for example, which is just very different to like an American high school. Uh, we've talked about the concentration mainly in school settings, education-based settings. I was surprised by this, that most of the studies are about sexual abuse. So of the um, 58 completed primary studies, fully 56 were about that. They're mainly about prevention. There were hardly any that focused on children at risk. We found zero that were conducted in religious organizations, so churches, faith-based groups, for example. That was also pretty surprising given the um, or the, the clerical sexual abuse scandals. The, almost all of them have appreciable risk of bias. I think all the randomized trials, um, none of the randomized trials have low risk of bias. Only one study, and this was of the Good Schools Toolkit, had educational attainment as an outcome. And that was really a surprise because there's so much money attached to education. It was kind of surprising that the other interventions hadn't hooked into that. As I mentioned, hardly anything on treatment in the last. Um, and then on safeguarding, which as Jane describes, is sort of where this all came from, there were, is very little um, understood. So, you know, what is the effect of having an institutional safeguarding policy? Basically, we don't really know. We found seven primary studies in that all, and they were mainly of um, training staff, for example. Um, and but you know, there's an enormous amount more that we need to know, which is and it's kind of odd given the focus that there has been on getting institutions to have safeguarding policies. Very, very few studies came from practitioners and nonprofits. They were almost all from academia. Um, many of you will know my view about operational nonprofits shouldn't try to do impact evaluations because they can't do it. Um, and it turns out that when you um, do a sift through the literature based on rigor, they all fall out. <laughs> So that was kind of what we found. Um, then a thing that we did, Jane, this is you, um, was to try and map, um, to look at where um, Porticus's grantees sit on this map. Jane, do you want to talk about that? Thanks, Caroline. Sorry. Um, so we, we were very much it's as if Caroline was the guide, but we, we were part of the workforce. Um, and what was the point of doing this if we didn't look at our grant holders, some of which are sophisticated organizations, but others are very local grassroots organizations, um, and use it almost as a familiarization exercise with ourselves to say, well, we've got the evidence map. Where's the grant holder map to see how that matches the evidence? We were quite interested to see if we were funding things in um, no land. But actually, it looks like we're significantly funding what Caroline calls a sandbank. Um, so, as I said, we're putting a lot of emphasis on institutional safeguarding practices. And I want to emphasize that I'm not saying that safeguarding isn't preventative. I'm just looking for some proof or some aspects because institutions are putting so much effort into safeguarding policies and practice. Um, that I think I think we're in danger of um, of getting exhausted by it. So I think it would be really interesting um, to see whether all aspects of all safeguarding are effective, or whether some aspects are more effective than others. 
So this was where our concentration of grants were, was, were in, we are guessing and hoping on a flimsy evidence base that all our grants on institutional safeguarding practices are actually going to lead to something that makes a difference in children's lives. Um, and then we have fewer grants in the area where there is more evidence, um, which is child well-being. Well -being. Um, so we thought that was important. And Caroline, do we have another slide that just unpacks that a little uh, bit? Yes. Next slide. So yeah, that's, I think that's just about what, what I said. Lots of grants, very few studies, and a uh, few, Fewer grants and more and more studies. So, what does that, what does that say about, what does that say about us? I suppose. Or what does it say about what we should be doing next? Uh, maybe we'll leave that till later. Yeah. So, okay. So that's um, the first part of, of what evidence is there. That's our EGM. Um, I just had a look in the chat, and I'm not seeing millions of questions about about where we are. But if you are completely lost. <laughs> Okay. Caroline, there, there isn't um, there isn't much. Should we just say what's there? Because um, it's really nice. Um, would love to hear ideas on how can these data maps be used to advocate for child protection impact evaluations at government levels in different countries. Thanks, thanks for that comment. That's brilliant to read. And there's this comment: best maps to protect our children, which sounds like the, the beginning of a project, but. Um, I'm not quite sure whether there's a question behind that that statement. Okay, so I'm going to keep going, and if you are lost, um, then please put your put a question or just shout in the box that you're lost, <laughs> and we will try to catch you up. Um, so I'm going. That was the that uh, that's our answer to question A. Um, is you know what evidence is there, and then we started to look at okay, what does that evidence say? Um, and so now I'm going to talk about the guidebook. Okay, and here is a complicated graph um, which shows that lots of um, foodstuffs both um, protect you against cancer and they also cause cancer. Okay, so each dot here is one medical study. And if the dot, so the first line here is studies of the effect of wine in terms of cancer. And you'll see that there are some studies that show that wine protects you from cancer. And there are some studies that show that wine causes cancer. Well, it can't do both, right? And the same for tomatoes. And if you look at uh, milk, for example, or eggs, it seems to be kind of about even Stevens in terms of, you know, some studies say one thing and some studies say the other. And it obviously can't be both. Um, and this was put together by, uh, well, John Ioannidis, who kind of used to be really respected. <laughs> That's another story. Um, and so the way that we, in the sort of evidence world, I know some of you know this um, extremely well, but some don't. So the way that we deal with this, like, multiplicity within the evidence world is to do a synthesis. So you take all the studies on, let's say, wine and cancer, and you squish them all together and you see net net what do they say so you give higher weighting to the bigger trials because they're less likely to be biased you give higher weighting to the ones that were done really well and you see like on aggregate what do they say so you do a synthesis of them and we had to do that kind of approach so in our guidebook um, we wanted to have which we did with Campbell um, we wanted to have something useful to say to policymakers and funders in every cell on the map. Okay, so as you saw before, I'm, I'm going to show you the interactive version later. Um, there are some cells on the map that only have one study. Um, and so for those, we did a summary of that study because if you are a policymaker or one of Jane's team or practitioner, it's kind of hard to read an academic study because they're a bit written to be incomprehensible, in my view. Um, so for cells that have only one or two primary studies, we wrote, and I think Anil is on the call who did a lot of this legwork, wrote a um, summary of that study, which is in sort of lay person's like everyday language. Um, there are cells which have three or more studies. I've written the wrong thing on the side. But in cells that have three or more studies, 
we did a synthesis because we were very aware of having the cancer wine problem that some studies might say one thing and some might say the other thing. So we did a synthesis, not a meta-analysis, those of you who know that, but we did a synthesis to see basically what is this um, evidence like all in telling us, okay? And so our guidebook actually has three sections. It has a kind of macro section, which describes the evidence in general. What does this evidence tell us about, what does it say about the effect sizes? You know, how big are the effects that things seem to have? What are the theories of change? What are the psychological theories that this is based on? How, what does this um, body of evidence tell us in terms of cost or cost effectiveness? So it's comments on the whole evidence base. Then there's a section of synthesis, which are syntheses, I should say. So for each cell with three or more studies, we have one there. And then um, for uh, less populous study, uh, cells, then we have these um, summaries. And just as a reminder, any decent study looks at what was happening before the intervention, what was happening after it, and then it also looks at some point in follow-up. So um, because you want to know, you know, what you don't want to only be measuring your effect like immediately after the um, intervention. You don't want to know whether anyone's got COVID like just the day after they have their, in their injection. You want to know like <laughs> sometime after that. Um, so, you know, some programs have zero effect, you have this flat line. Sometimes it creates a harm, you know, something gets worse. Sometimes you have a positive effect, but then it kind of tails off. You see this a lot in education programs, which are the majority on the map that you know people learn stuff and then they forget it over time and sometimes they go back to where they started or maybe they might retain a bit um sometimes you have a positive effect and it improved and it's maintained sometimes you have a positive effect and it and it and it creates a kind of virtuous cycle and so it improves over time even after the intervention has finished so this is the kind of thing we were trying to um draw out in terms of what do the studies say um, and this is, in summary, what we found the studies to say. So the effects that we found in general are small. Um, and that's true of most social science research, I would say. So the effects in general are small. That is to say, there's no like magic program where you do this program and then zing, you know, all of abuse within that population kind of disappears. There's no like inoculation against it. Um, so in general, um, programs were reducing harms by 10 percentage points, 20%, 10 or 20%, I should say. Um, the good tool, the good schools toolkit that I keep going on about for some reason in Uganda, um, before that, in advance, they were finding um, that 80% of school children had experienced violence by a staff member in the last month, 80%. Um, and by the way, this is not just, you know, a slap on the wrist. This was um, sometimes, um, Karen DeVries talks about uh, choking, burning and stabbing <laughs> by staff at school. Um, and then, so the, and the good school talk, it was pretty effective. It reduced it by a quarter, but uh, to, so still 60% of kids are experiencing that. Um, we found, importantly, we didn't find, or none of the studies seem to find evidence of harms. And obviously it's really super important to look at harms because you don't want to accidentally make things worse. Um, and there were some programs where you get a sort of funny effect, like, you, like there was one um, bringing in the bystander program that was educating high school um, children about 15, 16 years old in the States. Um, and as a result of that program, people disclose they they talk more about their own like violence by themselves they, they report kind of kind of report themselves more and that probably isn't because they are actually being more violent it's probably because they learn that some behaviors are unacceptable and they didn't realize it so for example um many um, students on that program didn't realize that sex between minors is legally considered rape Right. So it's probably not that they're doing things worse, it's that they now realize what's going on. But in general, we found no harms. And there were quite a few of the studies did look for harms to see if there was um, harm happening. Most of the studies are over a really short time period. Um, and that is a problem because um, abuse, as you know, loads of people take, I mean, the effects can be gigantic and extremely long term. 
Um, and many people take many years or many decades to um, recognize what's happened to them and to report it and to seek help and so on. Um, and the reason that most studies are short is because of budget, probably. Um, so in most of those education programs that are done in education settings on good touches versus bad touches, um, you measure the children's um, knowledge at the beginning, you measure the children's knowledge at the end, and you measure it again six months later, and then you're done. That doesn't tell you much about, you know, what they retain five or ten years later. Okay, so that's kind of a, a problem. Um, it's also the case that a lot of studies are really small, um, so they may only have a handful of schools in the treatment group and in the control group and that compromises their reliability. So I mean seeing as we're all now experts in trials because of the COVID trials, you will know that the Pfizer trial for example had 43,000 people in it and the reason it's important to have massive sample sizes sometimes is so that you can distinguish the effect of your program from the effect of everything else going on in the world. Um, and if you've only got four schools who get the thing and four schools who don't, you know, maybe there's something unusual about those four schools. And so it's not big enough to kind of even out all the effects. Um, so where we are funding um, research, so new research, and there needs to be loads more research right across the map. It needs to be really long and big enough to see the outcomes and to identify them accurately and long enough. The big outlier in terms of um, duration of the study is the Bucharest study that I mentioned, which is already, um, two decades long. And that, by the way, is funded mainly philanthropically by the MacArthur Foundation, seven billion dollar foundation in Chicago. Um, there were no studies, more or less no studies, that measured actual incidents of violence or abuse. Like most of them look at intermediate outcomes. So in the education programs I talked about, they look at acquisition and retention of knowledge. And that is great, and that's important, it's kind of necessary, but it's not, probably not sufficient, and it is not sufficient for us to know that abuse is actually being um, uh, reduced. Um, and there are also very few studies that have what you might call objective measures, so they're almost all self-reported. Again, there are some in the Bucharest study where the children go and, and somebody measures their height, weight, their head circumference, in one of them that I had to read, they measure the white auxological matter in their brain, that it, you know, um, to do with brain development. Um, so but most of it is self-reported um, data, and that obviously can be a, a bit unreliable. Like I said, only one has um, educational outcomes. Very few with children at risk. Most of them are at, with general population, so normal classes, for example. Um, there were some studies that got mixed results, so where um, they found that some things worked and some didn't. So the Bucharest study is another example um, where it did improve, so being placed in foster care does improve, um, I think, social skills and I think it improves like the, the physique. Um, but it had no effect. It had no effect on memory and um, executive functioning. Interestingly, um, and so there was that. We also found some cells where there were multiple studies, some of which found that something positive happened, and some found nothing. So there's one um, uh, cell um, which has a study in it. Um, that looks at um, at-risk boys in residential care and there are um, four primary studies in that cell, two of which found a positive effect and two of which found no effect. Um, and, and that's because even within our um, cells there's a heterogeneity of the precise populations and interventions and comparison groups that are used. Okay, so in the same way that on that um, the dotty study that I showed you about cancer, you know, when we say wine causes cancer, well, maybe it's like if you have white wine a bit sometimes that has one effect, but if you have red wine, tons of it all the time, <laughs> then it has a different effect. You've basically got a heterogeneous intervention there. Um, really striking that loads of the studies are quite old. So nearly half of them are from before 2000 and, um, uh, and 12. And that means that they were published before 2012. Those of you who have ever encountered academia will know there is a big delay 
between when a study actually finishes and when it publishes. So those studies might well have finished a decade ago. Um, and so loads of the evidence is quite old. Oh, there was some notes in there. Um, yeah, and almost none of them report cost data. We managed to find it, or Annie and Neil managed to find it, for one or two of the interventions that were in here. Um, but this is such a problem, and it's just um, so pervasive within social science, uh, is that people don't report their cost data, which means as a policymaker, obviously a consideration in whether to run an intervention is how much it costs. And you can't tell that by looking at the study, because no one's told you. And even in development economics, which this actually wasn't, but even in development economics, if you ask economists why they don't report this stuff, David Evans, then at the World Bank, has a blog post about this. He basically says, because cost, understanding cost is all a bit difficult. But even for World Bank economists, <laughs> you might think that's their job. Um, so pretty, in a way, quite disappointing. So by miles, the thing that is most measured is these good touches versus bad touches programs. And where they have been um, measured, which is in high income settings, they almost always seem to work. In fact, I think they always seem to work, but they've never been tested um, in low income settings. And that seems like really the kind of lowest hanging fruit here is that we have an intervention that's not very expensive, not very difficult, and it seems to work. And all we have to do is to take it to a low income setting um, and test it there. Like it seems to protect children. Uh, and so that would seem like a good idea. Okay, I'm now going to see if I can swap and show you our interactive version of our... Um, okay, can you see this? Yes, Carol, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, so this is our, this is the interactive version, and this is the stuff that you have already seen. Oh, I know I can't see it, that's weird. So it's you can there, see Caroline, it's fine. Okay, so sorry for not looking at you, but I, it's over here now. <laughs> so, um, this is some software that was created by University of College London, and Campbell helped to put our material into it, and it's fantastic. So you can, and this is the version that I suggest any of you use, and it has in it, because Campbell are really clever, it has in it the evidence and gap map um, information. You can also get through to the raw academic studies. It also has in it most of the guidebook material, in the cells to which it relates, okay? So I'm gonna talk first about what is where. So um, you will see that here are our four um, rows on prevention, disclosure, uh, response and treatment, okay? And here are the um, outcome, the outcome uh, cells that we discussed. Uh, and now you can read them all, it's kind of easier. Um, and each blob here is a study. So this cell here, which is about institutional safeguarding, has two randomized control trials in it and one protocol. A protocol is a, the recipe for a study that has not happened yet. It hasn't published yet. We found three within our uh, square on the field, three um, recipes, three planned studies, all of which were for RCTs actually. Um, and so if you go, uh, so you can see there's, there's three studies here. This study has a load, this cell has a load more, has six RCTs, three QEDs, and five systematic reviews. Um, here is the mega cell with, uh, like I said, it's got 51, 50 completed studies and one protocol. Um, and so if you go into a, if you click on each cell, this is the normal, um, uh, functionality of an evidence camera. Um, okay. Then you can see each of the studies. So here's the three. And what we've done is put into each cell, and this is the abstract from the study. So those of you familiar with academic studies will know they all have an abstract at the beginning. Um, this is the abstract, so you can get a sense of it. Okay. So there's um, there's three of these here, one, two, three. Um, like I said, where there is a study 
that is on its own, if we have a cell that's only got one study in it or two studies in it, we wrote a summary of that study. So here's an example. This is like a response intervention and it's with adult care providers. This is going to be Rheingold. <laughs> um, so here is the abstract. Um, okay, this link here at the oh, I can't see this link now because I've got this thing. It's, thing it's there, Caroline. It takes you right through to the original. Okay. Um, and oh, sorry. This is this is the abstract. You click on the study, you see the abstract, and then if you click on this DOI thing here, then I'm not going to do this because it's never going to work in my uh, in this sharing. But that takes you through to the actual your study. Um, and this, if you click on the Campbell thing, or up here, um, this takes you to, can you see this now? Yes. This takes yeah. you to the yep. part of the guidebook. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So this is the part of the guidebook of, that summarizes that study. Okay. So it tells you that it's moderate risk of bias and it has a summary of it, what type of study it was, and then it tells you what it says. And it's written in much more everyday language than an um, uh, academic paper normally is. Okay. So where there are cells that have loads of studies in, the, the, pop, the heavy cells we call them, then here you can see all the individual studies and for each of them here's, oops, Know what happened there. Here's the abstract, um, and you can link through to the, the link on, the, on Springer. Um, I think somebody from Nature was joining this call. Um, so you can get through to the raw thing. And at the top, there's this extra item, and that is, um, takes you to our summary of, or our synthesis of all of those studies. And what you see here in, the, in this software tool is our, this is a summary of the summary. <laughs> our summary of our synthesis okay so here if you click on this it will take you through to as i say the the synthesis of the all the studies within that caroline we've got a couple of things in there's a question and a there's two questions in the chat that might be worth answering right now while we're in the interact one was how did we rate the potential level of bias and the other one is to elaborate on your um, they say, could you please repeat the name of the low-hanging fruit intervention for a tr transfer and test in low-income settings? Oh yeah, okay. So the um, what I call the low-hanging fruit is are these? Pro these are great questions, and thank you for being engaged. Um, are these programs done in educational settings? So typically with primary school or before in early childhood development settings. And they are to teach children about good touches versus bad touches. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head whether there are any branded programs. And Neil or Howard might be able to remember this. Is the red flag, green flag one? I can't remember. Well, let's have a look. Let's see if we can work it out from here. So here is, so they, those are the, those are the interventions which are studied in this massive cell here, the heaviest cell, the most popular cell. Um, and look, this synthesis is of the cell of the largest number of studies. Um, and so you can get through, whoever wrote that question, I will I'll happily follow up with you on email. Um, they are rated as um, low risk of bias because basically all the studies that are done are pointed the same way. And it seemed to us relatively low hanging fruit to take one or more. I think in this cell, there are multiple different interventions. So they're all kind of good touch, bad touch type programs, but they, excuse me, they vary a bit in precisely what is taught and how, and indeed the ages of the children. Um, and um, so that is what I was talking about. Um, All right, I just come on that one. So yeah. they're both good touch, bad touch, and red flag, green flag, are there those specific books? My own daughter actually had good touch, bad touch when she was at elementary school in, in living in Washington. And so we, we still have the book of good touch, bad touch. Red flag, green flag is an, another. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, and then what was the other question, Jane? It was um, about how did we assess risk of bias? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there are. 
So we have three types of study on the map, randomized trials, QEDs, and uh, quasar experimental designs, which are a bit like randomized trials. And we have systematic reviews. And um, randomized trials and quasar experimental designs are primary studies. They are studies in people. And a systematic review is a study of studies. It's secondary research. Um, and there are standard tools for looking at the risk of bias of all, all three of those. So, so one tool for each. So there's a, um, a tool produced by the Cochrane Collaboration for looking at risk of bias in, um, uh, in randomized trials. And there's a separate one for QEDs and there's one called PRISM for um, looking at um, systematic reviews. And we use those. Um, and they are all detailed in the long report. And I'm sure Howard could give you a three hour answer on how <laughs> they all work. Um, each of them has, and I did have a slide on this, but I think I chucked it out. I thought it might be too detailed. Um, each of them um, looks at, so with a, a primary study, there are various domains of potential sources of bias that you look at. So for example, if, do you, does the study tell you, does the report, the, the document that you get, the academic study, does it tell you how people were randomized? And if it doesn't tell you, then it gets marked as being um, higher risk of bias. It doesn't mean it is biased, but there's risk of bias because basically some ways of randomizing are better than others. Okay, so if you have just like a person tossing a coin, for example, there's actually a pretty terrible way of randomizing because the person might decide, oh, they really want you to get the intervention because they reckon it's going to work. And so they're like, oh, let's just pretend that that didn't happen and I'll just flip this coin again until it comes up heads. <laughs> um, whereas there are other ways that are much more watertight, basically. Equally, one domain is about whether you look at all the people that started the program versus if you look only at the people who finished the program. So for example, suppose that you have a trial of a vaccine and it kills lots of people, right? Um, but everybody who survives is fine and they then never get flu ever again. Well, if you only look at the people who are left at the end of the trial, you will miss the fact that this intervention is killing lots of people, okay, which is a pretty important outcome. Um, and so um, that will make your results look biased because it will make the um, intervention, the, in the vaccine, look like it was really great and it stopped you getting flu. It will, it will be biased in a positive way. And so, um, Sometimes, so you want trials to look at what's called the intention to treat. You look at everybody, they include everybody who starts, not just those who finish. And sometimes because there's really important reasons that people drop out. Maybe people drop out of the, um, you know, teachers drop out of the training program because they hate it, you know, or maybe, you know, um, children stop, or parents pull children out of some educational intervention because they find it offensive or the child is really scared by the whole notion of abuse, for example. And that's really important to know. So if somebody doesn't, if a report doesn't tell you about um, what it's what's happened in the study or how the study's been done, then you can't be sure that it wasn't biased. So we put it as high, higher risk of bias. Okay, I hope that kind of answers that. Um, I'm also just gonna tell you a bit more about this amazing tool. So within this, so here is our whole evidence and gap map and all the studies. Um, and this tool, if you go into filters, will allow you to filter it, surprisingly enough. So, so you can look at, you know, maybe you only want to look at completed RCTs, or you might be interested here in the left on children. Can you see the map now, Jean? Yeah. Um, of children of a particular age or populations who are of a particular type. Um, or you might be interested in a particular type of maltreatment, um, or quite likely you're going to be interested in on a geographic basis. So, as you, um, so let's look at Africa. I'm just going to select Africa here and then update the map. So it's now going to only show me studies that were conducted in Africa, and you are going to see that. Oopsie! You are going to see that there are not many. Okay. So, so oh, what happened? Oh. Oops. Okay, ooh, can you still see it? 
Yes, we can. We can see um, green, uh, yellowy green, um, and um, sort of gray, gray brown. Okay, so this is the same map, but now only showing you studies that were conducted in Africa. And as you can see, there are many fewer of them. So we've only got two here. Um, and even in the most populous cell, we've only got four or five, sorry. So remember that this was the, uh, where is it even gone? Our child knowledge and awareness, this, this cell here, can you see what I'm pointing at? This is the one which, this is our mega cell, right? Which has 58 completed primary studies. And now it's completely empty because none of them is from Africa. Okay, also, um, the bottom three rows of this map, I can just get rid of Jane's face so I can see it. Um, the bottom three rows here have got nothing at all <laughs> from Africa. So there's nothing at all about disclosure or response or treatment from Africa. Um, so that's pretty uh, important and it's pretty quick to, um, to find um, that kind of thing. Or you might decide, you know, that you're interested in um, South America um, and the only countries in South America that had studies were Ecuador and Jamaica. I'm pretty sure about that. Yes. So if I update for South America, um, where are they? Oops. Um, then, um, you know, I've got hardly any. And as I said, a study can appear in multiple cells. So these are actually only two studies, one of which is a protocol, by the way, so it hasn't even happened. This is the only completed study from um, uh, South America. So, you know, it's kind of a, a bad joke for people studying research to say that more evidence is needed, but it really is <laughs> needed because there's just massive areas of this map that um, are uh, almost completely, almost completely empty or are, which actually are completely empty. Um, okay, so now I'm going to try and get back to the PowerPoint. Oopsie. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. So the findings. The You're on the findings okay. slide. Okay. Yeah. So there we are. So that's what I was going to talk about. With oh, heavens, but now I can't. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so. <laughs> Okay, I now can't see what's coming up. It's so oh, we're in Yesland um, and um, yeah. So as I, as I mentioned, we um, we were expecting to find these three areas: Yesland, Noland, and Sandbank. And as we pointed out, there is not a whole lot in Yesland. Um, there's a lot of Noland, and um, the and there's quite a lot of Sandbank. So that's what we were going to present. And then, lastly, just to talk about what we're going to do next, Jane, do you want to talk about this? I'll try, I'll try to, yeah, I'll try to, to say a little bit. Um, first of all, I, one of the things we're funding, um, we have a preliminary study to a randomized control trial with 10 primary schools in Zimbabwe um, being um, led by um, Kirst, Karen Deveries at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and her team. So we're trying to fill one of the, one of the cells on the map and we're looking at a whole, a whole school. So this is class, classroom and a wider school approach to, I hesitate to call it safeguarding because it is an anti-child violence um, safeguarding initiative. So currently being piloted in 10 primary schools to see what we what we learn um, and, and how to do how to design the RCT which would be in 40 schools in Zimbabwe and cost an enormous amount of money um, so so that's one of the things we're doing which is which is fantastic we're working with Caroline on trying to prioritize um, what evidence we might fund. We're working with a, a wonderful group of foundations, including um, Oak, Comic Relief. We're in a safeguarding funders group. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to take the question of safeguarding as an intervention and evaluate it more rigorously together with a group of funders. 
because we this this can't be for Porticus on its own. If you think of Oxfam, um, the the recent dreadful um, abuse of a child in Central Africa Republic through the Caritas network, um, there's there has to be a really big cons concerted effort um, on evidence and ed evidence and child safety. So um, I suppose, with, I mean, this is part of this webinar, really. It's sort of introducing this to you as a public good and saying, if you like this, if you're excited by it, if you feel that we could make this map a really amazing roadmap, um, then, yeah, then, then, then join with us and, and get in touch. So it's a bit of a call. Um, there's a there's a commitment by Porticus to do to do s something, although I'm querulous at the cost of the research. Um, and um, yeah, just wanted to say thank you, and also to thank the researchers for because I just feel that this stuff is inherently interesting, and it usually isn't written up for people like me. Yet, I have the responsibility for making funding decisions. So I feel this is a, this is a genuine bridge to the wonderful research that's gone on. So that's my sort of pitch, I think, about what next. Great, okay. Um, just to say, so Jane talked about mapping um, Portuguese's grantees against the evidence in Gatmap. We also tried to map the activity of the wider child protection sector. So, for instance, you know, really aware that, you know, most schools in the global north have a safeguarding policy, but no one seems to have evaluated them properly. Um, and it turned out to be hard slash impossible slash messy to do that because the data don't exist nobody seems to have a decent data set about the amount and type of child protection activity and that seemed an interesting finding of itself there's a world health organization report that came out in 2012 funded by optimus foundation actually and um they were <laughs> world health organization was going to update that in may last year but obviously in april and may last year the world health organization was kind of busy so they didn't <laughs> um, and then we're starting to do work with Porticus's grantees to look at the implications um, for them. You know, what do you, what do you say to a grantee when it turns out that there's no evidence for what they do, no rigorous evidence? You know, they, they might feel massively undermined by that. But like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do for grantees um, who are in yes land, but the evidence is really mixed? You know, we just got to figure out the, um, what kind of conversations, where are we trying to take them to? Um, and then, um, I think as Jane mentioned, in yes land, sometimes you, there are implications for funding delivery work and in, in no land, then there's implications for funding new um, uh, research. Um, so now I can't move my thing. Um, so that is kind of it. So basically there's two things that you use an evidence and gap map for. And I think this starts to speak to one of the questions. Um, which is that in yes land you use it to influence practice and in no land you use it to influence research production so to the, this is like a glib answer to what is a good question about how does one use this to advocate for more um, research from governments quite often evidence and gap maps in various sectors are used for exactly that because they really show where the gaps are so for example the center for homelessness impact in the uk which is our now has become the government's what work center on homelessness they're brilliant um, they did an evidence and gap map very similar to ours and i mean it's largely empty and they have used that to advocate for more research and they're also going around and trying to fund the production of more research there there was a question um from geordie about is there an implementation issues map coming and i know that the center for homelessness impact in the UK has done one. Uh, actually, we haven't thought about doing one. Um, yeah, so that's the answer to that. <laughs> um, so that is it um, here, oopsie, and um, here. So should we take some questions? That, that's it, that's the end, that's the end.
Um, so uh, we... Caroline, can we just mention the Alliance um, magazine article this oh, month? Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's gone in. Maybe we could send that? around a link. So, um, so Caroline um, Joachim, who's based in, who's one of the Porticus team, and Isabel, who's our safeguarding consultant, have jointly written an article on the evidence gap map in this month's um, Alliance magazine. So just to, just to mention, this is part of our um, sort of promulgation exercise to, to raise awareness of, the, of this and the use of the map, which has, if, if we are going to be an evidence-based funder, we can't, we can't do it without, without jumping in like this. So it's, thanks for the link. Yeah, and actually just to say that article, um, it talks about Porticus, I think this is really great, Porticus's kind of attempt to learn seriously in, in, through two routes. One is through looking at the rigorous published literature, which is the gap map and the guidebook. And the other is, which I wasn't involved in at all, uh, is through learning from its own experiences. And so they set up, they've got the team to, pri to list and then prioritize um, questions that they wanted to learn about and then each member of the team had a learning diary where people would you know note things that they came across in their everyday work you know articles you bump into or meetings that you bump into or whatever um, that pertain to those questions and then um, and then they have consolidated what they've learned uh, in relation to each of those questions which I think is a great way of going about learning and both are described in the alliance article um okay thank you for all these questions um so there's a question here from kirsten about jla which is a joint learning initiative on faith and local communities caroline can i interrupt we've answered that one we're saying, okay we've made outstanding questions from helen helen pearson from Nature. So what do your findings mean for major institutions in the face of face abuse scandals, like church, sports organizations, and so on? And are the steps they've taken to address them um, not, not evidence-based, because there's only hard evidence to go on? Yeah, I think so. Well, shall I have a bit of a, because, so thank you, Helen, but that is exactly what the evidence and gap map is for. So, I would say almost but not quite. So there are some, there is some evidence on the, on the map. Um, there's evidence about disclosure. There's evidence about good touch, bad touch. There's evidence that if you start to talk to children, staff, youth workers, police about safeguarding, then disclosure goes up. Um, so we can, we can see that even just talking about things, talking about good touch, bad touch, does good. And even when people suspect that there might be harm, the research that we have suggests that, that this information is, is no harm. I, I know it's very little, um, but I also don't want to, put faith-based organizations in, into, into a big sort of, you know, no, they haven't done anything that's evidence-based. I mean, common sense is based on evidence. If you're doing background checks on your people, if, if you are placing um, glass, glass walls in confessionals rather than wooden walls, I mean, people are trying to make their best, their best common sense, um, attempts um but it does look like the evidence it is very scanty sorry Ca caroline or howard is there a better answer to that question i'd like to reinforce what you said just asking people just asking children about it makes a difference so in this good schools toolkit which caroline mentioned the baseline survey uncovered enormous amounts of abuse that, were, that was unknown about prior to the survey being done because because no one was asking and yes. it wasn't just in, in, that was in Uganda, that study. It wasn't just in Uganda. We saw the same in, in high-income country studies where even in the control group, just because people were now asking, 
they identified abuse that was not known about because no one had actually bothered asking. So just asking did, did make an enormous difference. I did want, we, we're out of time, but there's a question Sonal uh, Kapoor asked very early on about how can we use something like, well, this map and, and similar maps like it to advocate for impact evaluation with governments. Do you have any views on this? Well, that's in a way what, what I was trying to, to speak to is um, part of the, firstly, if you have a map and it's done properly, then you kind of know where the gaps are. And so it's much stronger thing on which to advocate than just having kind of a hunch and kind of moaning. <laughs> you can actually say, and this is also part of the reason, another reason for doing the study as it were scientifically. So setting out our um, square on the field and, and being very systematic about the way that we search for studies because then there's no accusation. And part of the reason that we put it through academic peer review is that then there's no accusation that we screwed it up or that there's a bunch of studies that we missed because we didn't happen to bump into them or whatever. So it becomes a bit incontrovertible. So then we have, that's the kind of land that one can stand on for this sort of advocacy. I mean, you still then have to do all the normal actual advocacy things of building a relationship and going and talking to the relevant people and being convincing and being clear about what you actually want them to do and ensuring that they have budget and decision rights and all of that, all of that evidence into policy stuff, you know, because now you're using evidence about the lack of research to advocate for policy and funding the production of more research. Mm -hmm. Then you're into bog standard evidence into policy terrain, I would suggest. I, I do think the conclusion you draw, draw yourself, Caroline, about good touch, bad touch type interventions, saying, well, it's proven to work, but mainly in the US. And so it would be sort of obvious to do this in an African country or an Asian country and, and test it there because decision makers always want to know, well, well, the American evidence, evidence may not be relevant to us. You know, got, not going to do it in English. How could you translate this? There are cultural sensitivities around these issues. But how do we portray it locally? And so we had the same issue of the homelessness maps. We've mentioned the homelessness maps a couple of times. They're also done by Campbell. Um, and so 160 odd RCTs on homelessness, seven from the UK, a handful less from Europe. They're nearly all from North America, both US and Canada. And so when researchers and practitioners say in the UK, oh, but it's not possible to do RCTs and homelessness programs, it ain't so, okay? There are hundreds of them, literally, from, from North America. We have models we can use to see how you design RCTs of these programs. So that so, so the maps can help you go a stage further and say, when, you, when you're not in no land, um, say you're on your sandbank, saying, well, there is evidence for this. It looks promising. It's been tested elsewhere, but let's... Let's test it here. So you've got something concrete to go on, or to do particularly what so what um, Portugal did. So we we advocate doing evidence maps, look on the supply side of evidence, but also what we call an evidence needs assessment to see what the interest decision maker are, and say well where there's an evidence need but there's no, there's an evidence gap, that's where you should be prioritising your research because you want evidence there and you're in no land. So go go ahead and commission some primary studies in that area. So I think there, there's a basis for discussion. But of we just oh, lost Howard's how sound. Howard, we can't hear you. Maybe you have to type what you're saying. <laughs> oh, we can hear you now. I think you're back. Okay. <laughs> I, I was just saying that, uh, now it's gone again. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Um, that, of course, as Jane mentioned, the primary studies are very expensive and many maps you find are under-reviewed. It's not so much the case here, but you have half your reviews than there are primary studies. In that case, you, your first reaction would be, well, actually, the areas are here where we can do some systematic reviews to learn about what works before we go to the next step about thinking what intervention we'd want to do. I can see people leaving. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody for for showing so much interest. It's incredibly, it's incredibly heartening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to Jane and Caroline for the very interesting presentation. A lot of very good reactions. And thank you for all of you who have stayed. Just to mention two more things. One is thank you again to American Institutes for Research for sponsoring our webinar series. And secondly, our next webinar, April the 13th, 
picture of diaries out now, April the 13th, also at 3 p.m. It's joined with the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, um, and we're looking at the mapping very closely to the area. We've got two evidence maps on, on other evidence maps of child well-being, one a mega map of systematic reviews on child well-being, and one on violence against children. And we're going to be presenting the, um, the mega map in the part, well, not me, the people who did it, the mega map in, in our seminar next month, our webinar next month. So look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, everyone. And Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.